Hi, I'm Branko. I'm the co-founder of Uniquely and uh, Cybersecurity Professional by Practice. Uh, October is the month of cybersecurity awareness. And uh, in the past weeks, we've been using our social media platform to communicate some very useful security awareness materials to you. And uh, we want to wrap this month up with the very candid conversation between two cybersecurity professionals and talk about most important cybersecurity topics. And today with me, I have Damian Cetanovic, our dear colleague from Uniquely and the expert in offensive security and ethical hacking. So Damian, tell me about uh, offensive security and the motivation of cyber criminals. Uh, what do you think are the latest trends in terms of uh, why so many attacks are happening in the world and what is driving this crime and cyber force? Thank you, Branko, for the brief introduction. So as part of the Cyber Security Awareness Month, October of 2022, uh, we would actually like to help companies and employees understand these risks. And these risks are are starting actually with the trends we have seen lately. There are two, three main trends regarding, of course, money, power, and actually there's a new trend involving script kiddies. Uh, script kiddies are actually hackers that do not have a technical background. So basically the script kiddies are not well versed in hacking, but they <laughs> of course, know how to use Google and the internet. Right. And basically, they're using a lot of tools that are maybe even open source, and they can get to your comp into your company, compromise your accounts, and steal your credentials, steal, steal your money, and make a really, really big impact on your company. Uh, so is this um, like a, a reputational kind of game that they are trying to uh, accomplish, like to prove themselves, or they're really after something uh, more specific? Well, that's well, very good question. So uh, regarding the adversaries and mercenaries that are actually highly paid to do that. Uh, like yes. guns for hire, right? Yeah, exactly. That would be the answer. But regarding the, the third trend, the, the script kit is basically anyone who's just playing and thinking that's a internet is a hacking playground. Uh, no, they are not motivated. They are just experimenting and unfortunately ending up in jail for that. Right. So more uh, gamification kind of uh, entertainment, really. Exactly. So right. so we've seen in the last five years in the top cybersecurity countries, uh, including US, UK and so on, We've seen a lot of teenagers who get into the companies mm -hmm. and who are really successful just because they have used the internet. They have found like a zero day, but not from the technical side, but they have found it on dark net, dark web or anywhere online. Right, right. So um, uh, what do you think we can do to kind of uh, drive this uh, trend down and actually, you know, try to reduce the number of these uh, young individuals going into the wrong direction? Well, of course, through mentorship. Uh, and actually, we are doing a lot of things regarding that. So now a lot of universities have like hacking sponsorship, uh, CTF, meaning capture the flag competitions, right. where young kids, high school uh, individuals can actually through the Hack through the safe hacking playground, they can actually do that and even sometimes earn money. Uh, there are programs called bug bounty programs right. that actually offer money for safe, ethical and legal hacking nowadays. So that's a really good initiative. And of course, through cybersecurity awareness of those individuals. So we should communicate to them that hacking is illegal, but they can do pretty much the same thing and even earn a lot of money. Yeah, and build companies. a successful career. I mean, like you have done since uh, <laughs> yeah, since uh, like also uh, very early in uh, uh, in your career. Um, yeah, that's uh, we've seen definitely a lot of uh, of these of these trends and uh, uh, especially um, especially around state sponsored attacks that have been happening quite a bit around the world. Uh, what do you think about that? Like what um, uh, we definitely can agree that it's political motivation in this uh, uh, 
in this situation that is driving these attacks. And uh, there are huge budgets behind these attacks as state sponsored. So meaning that a large teams of probably highly experienced individuals with a lot of tools on their disposal and a huge infrastructure behind them. Um, uh, what do you think about, um, about these attacks and, uh, you know, is, is there something governments in general need to know? uh about uh, these types of attacks yeah definitely so that would be our our second topic uh the the governments and the political motivation behind those attacks and out of those three actually the this type of attack is is the scariest because uh also the the script kiddies i have mentioned and also the second group just wanting to so the black cat hackers who want to steal your money eventually end up in governments so I don't think they are just forced, but it's actually an elite career to work f for the top governments and to do research. Th those topics are, are really, really serious. And basically the top governments, of course, have the top hackers in their toolkit to, to do the work for them. So everything that was used 20 or 30 years ago, like the tools such as James Bond or right. even some aircrafts are not so important nowadays uh, when you can do everything online. And the main army strength is in hacking. Yeah, I can definitely agree. Uh, it's moving online uh, fairly quickly. I mean, we've seen uh, also a lot of uh, um, a lot of very highly technical attacks uh, being used in the latest conflict uh, in Ukraine, also with the uh, um, you know, with the use of uh, satellite internet, uh, I think Starlink and Elon Musk uh, were the ones, you know, kind of providing the entirely new to the game uh, infrastructure, you know, to uh, to continue with the warfare. And uh, it's just completely scary, you know, in the direction that this is yeah. moving towards. So um, uh, that's definitely a, a very important topic. And we've seen also in the Balkan area, in uh, Europe, also a lot of uh, these uh, attacks happening. But w what we've seen is that governments were not ready to respond uh, a lot to these uh, threats and uh, uh, that uncovered some of the bad practices in cybersecurity, actually. And now to, you know, kind of make the parallel, um, do you think that government, government programs in cybersecurity, you know, uh, should be improved and if so, in what way? I totally agree. And that's also a very interesting topic. Uh, the shortest explanation on what has happened is actually a, a good sentence by the former director of FBI. Uh, he said that nobody will think about cybersecurity until something happens, which we have seen. We, have, we can uh, all agree on that. <laughs> definitely, which we have seen, especially this summer in our region, but also in countries across the whole Definitely world. Global, yeah. uh, so they didn't have a budget before something happened. And now the, the budgeting is really good. <laughs> also, a lot of cybersecurity service companies are contacted after that. And yeah, uh, that can be improved if the security is, uh, if you think about security in a proactive way. So basically, you will save a lot of money. There, there's actually a good article and a lot of university studies that show that cybersecurity is a profit generator. And basically, uh, the one thing that's for 100% sure is that you will get hacked. It's just the point of time when it's going to happen. Yeah, and how big of damage you're going to suffer uh, that first time. Uh, yeah, that's true. I can definitely agree on that. I mean, working in a, in that field for Quite a bit. I've seen uh, many pain points, you know, in uh, in private uh, companies, you know, in private sector mostly. Uh, but in comparison, uh, it's definitely it's definitely a big gap uh, between uh, you know how governments are handling security, approaching to security towards the private sector, as we also can safely assume that the private sector has uh, you know more motivation and funds uh, to and also smaller scope at that front as well to um, to make a really comprehensive cybersecurity program, even though I've seen all kinds of issues in, in that sector. Um, 
uh, I think definitely the the government uh, sector uh, simply needs to um, uh, to step up in this front and actually be the leader and be the uh, uh, the role model to yeah. the private sector in each country of how cybersecurity should be. Yeah, I definitely agree. And uh, the bad thing that currently is that it's the other way around. So I think that maybe the biggest issue is that, you know, governments exist for at least 100 years, maybe even thousands of years, and enterprises and small startups exist for a few years, generally. And that's the thing behind the sentence about scope that you said. So governments have a lot of establishments, a lot of applications regarding like everything from water supplies to electricity and companies are usually just care for their business. So it's very hard to start, but I guess it is, it's pretty obvious now that no, it has absolutely. to be done. Yeah. The, the complexity is definitely huge in comparison uh, in, in, in the government sector. Uh, but um, it's, you know, it's hard to to, to find excuses, you know, to uh, to just like why why something was not set up correctly. I think um, um, I think the the a lot of the awareness part is is missing uh, still, and uh, it still needs to be addressed uh, on the critical sector of uh, you know just just how important cybersecurity is, and not just cybersecurity. I think the the um, the digital transformation is still way behind. I mean, it's something we've been talking for about 10 years now already, and uh, it's still something that's that's heavily being discussed to this day and in the government <clears throat> sector, especially as the um, as the environment that's still lacking behind, you know, this digital transformation moving to more uh, uh, e side of things and uh, uh, even to cloud infrastructure. We've seen uh, we've seen, uh, for example, Pentagon in, in the United States have signed the agreement with Azure to um, you know, to move uh, uh, at least part of their infrastructure into the cloud environment, which was, you know, a huge move, um, considering that cloud was being considered unsecure. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, and we've seen that that's actually not true. It's, it's simply yeah. just how you use it. But that's because uh, in the United States, there is a new a hot topic called digital trusts. So basically yeah. people there know what they are doing mostly. The, they set most of the trends nowadays and they, they trust each other. So it starts, it all starts from the policies, procedures and the actual cybersecurity strategy, strategy that is lacking in, in most of the country, in m most of the other countries we have seen. Yeah, we've, uh, yeah, definitely. They, well, the, a lot of the uh, I have to say, advancements in cybersecurity have moved from the west to east, and uh, sometimes they say, you know, the further <laughs> east you are, the the later you're gonna get the latest security updates. But I think yeah. we in the middle kind of <laughs> suffer the most uh, in this sense. But um, uh, uh, the private sector is doing a lot to address this issue. I, I've seen uh, very good trends. The, the just the month of October with this cybersecurity awareness campaign that every company is doing. I think it's a great thing. Um, but uh, uh, definitely the, the defensive perimeter starts with people um, through processes and technology, you know, to, to, to kind of achieve that, that, that high status. So let's, uh, yeah, let, let's see about the defensive side of things. Since we discussed quite a bit about, um, you know, the motivations between, uh, actually motivations behind uh, different uh, uh, cyber criminals, you know, why they attack, who they attack, and uh, some of the latest, uh, um, you know, high value targets uh, by governments. Um, I, I think the, uh, the conversation that makes the news is, you know, how somebody got hacked and what they did wrong. But um, I'm still lacking quite a bit of discussions uh, about how to protect, you know, how to technology agnostic, you know, not yeah. technology sponsored Definitely. articles about how to protect, you know, use our solution. Uh, if they used our solution, they wouldn't go, gotten through this <laughs> attack. Like there yeah. was this, uh, I think it was, it was actually a huge backlash about the Uber uh, mm. cybersecurity incident recently, where actually all these cybersecurity professionals started defending Uber because they understand it's <laughs> quite natural to, yeah. to just get <laughs> hacked like that. Yeah, the, the, that's the thing nowadays. So a lot of companies that I've seen uh, want to uh, 
protect their whole company and they are not actually breach oriented. So even from the the top C-level security guys in Microsoft, they are a breach oriented company, which means mm -hmm. that you are, are expecting a breach. You know that it will happen and then you do things regarding that. And the best way to, do, to actually start with that is by doing security awareness trainings and making a secure culture in your company. Right, right. Yeah. So I, I can first definitely agree with the point of, uh, you know, breach oriented approach, meaning that, uh, you know, make your peace with that, that the breach will happen, but be extremely prepared to react to the breach as fast and as efficient as possible um, to simply to minimize the impact of the organization to try to identify the breach happening like within minutes, if possible, even less. And uh, yeah, that's the defensive strategy. Uh, the cultural aspect, I think, this is something I also talk quite a bit about. Is I believe is 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 extremely important. Um, I've seen companies, you know, have these two approaches with cybersecurity, bad approaches with uh, either not doing anything about cybersecurity mm -hmm. until you know it's too late, and even then, doing the absolute minimum. So. Actually, those both as, uh, aspects, not doing anything about it or doing the absolute minimum to satisfy somebody else's needs and requirements, such as you want to make a deal with a big company like a bank, they have security requirements, you do the bare minimum so you can show that you have something yeah. just to win a big deal and just, <laughs> you know, just put the security under the rug. I think that's extremely common and I believe a lot of people will associate with that. but. The cultural aspect is actually, I think, the, the holy grail of good security practice. Training your employees to yeah. not just be security aware, but to communicate from the top level that security is important, that we care about security, that this is something that the C-level, you know, is something they're losing sleep over. It's yeah. something that we want everybody in our organization <laughs> to understand that whatever you do, Think about cybersecurity aspect of it. Definitely, right? I agree with you. And the thing is that you can do that without money and without budget and in a really fun way, in a fun fashion. So when I was an information security officer at the company, so there were a lot of policies and people were leaving their desktops open, their chats open, anybody could sit there and steal their credentials, information, read the whole email box from an employee there. And we, we actually managed to, to solve that in, in an easy and a fun way. So the employees were permitted actually to sit on their friend's desktop, uh, laptop right, or, right, or right. mobile device, and they could uh, write funny messages in Slack or Teams. And in, in that way, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they yeah. were a bit embarrassed and it was funny, but actually the, the effect was that after two weeks, nobody was leaving their laptop open, everybody was locking their laptop. So that, that was a simple example of how can right. you really understand the culture and do that in a fun way without actually any money. You're using your own resources to raise cybersecurity awareness. Right, actually that, that's a very good example, I think, of uh, your you know, security ambassadors in the company that can actually exist within any department. You know, it can be in finance, HR, engineering, DevOps, IT, I hope, or IT, uh, that, uh, you know, just somebody that is super hyped about cybersecurity shares the care and vision of the management, you know, about cybersecurity and within their areas of influence, which is their teams that they sit with every day or remotely talk with every day, that they would, you know, correct their actions along longer periods of, of time and constantly impose these um, you know, corrective actions in uh, in good security practice. And this is a great example, just Definitely. don't leave your laptop open, I think. <laughs> yeah. is, uh, is In a uh, gamification way. Yeah, gamification. I've seen actually some quite, uh, some examples that even went a bit too far. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I think uh, that, that, that that is a great example. But I think the continuous education and communication, I think is the key. This is not something you're done with. It's something you are sticking with. It's part of the culture, right? That's the whole point. Definitely. It's an ongoing process. It should be incorporated into your change management, asset management, your daily activities, also your team buildings. Absolutely. So if Absolutely. you're on team building, if you're 
exchanging your best stories while having a drink, you shouldn't forget that, of course, maybe your mobile phone is exposed to an external attacker. <clears throat> Absolutely true. Um, I, I think that what's, what's, what's stopping the companies from, you know, just doing something about cybersecurity in a proactive fashion, uh, I think is the, um, uh, it's, it's just a myth, an extremely wrong one that cybersecurity is a cost center. It's something that, you know, wastes money, uh, something that costs and not, <laughs> is not contributing to the, uh, you know, security uh, to, to the revenue of the company. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, definitely. Everybody thinks that it, security, cybersecurity is really expensive, which can be true, but in in that same way, it will bring you more money and not just because you're protecting something and you're protecting your resources. You could use your cybersecurity service, your cybersecurity product and your cybersecurity policies and procedures, of course, in your sales department, for example. Everybody would rather prefer a secure company. So we have the CIA triad. So confidentiality, integrity and availability. Right. Those three things are pretty much what security stands for. And if you have that, you will easy. It would be really easier to sell your products and everything. Everybody would prefer you rather than somebody who doesn't even know how their security looks like. So exactly what you're saying. Um, I, I fully agree that the, um, you know, the uh, aspect of chasing your revenue uh, through cybersecurity is not just something that that you should try out is something that's heavily proven. In the West, they have already already been using these methods of uh, marketing cybersecurity, even though you're not a cybersecurity company. Um, uh, just using security as a feature, using security as, you know, um, as means to compete with uh, uh, with your competitors uh, in terms of protecting user data. And mostly I've seen these companies in the B2B SaaS and B2C companies, uh, healthcare, fintech, highly regulated industries as well, uh, using cybersecurity as their main sales tactic to win big deals, uh, to win more customers, to increase trust in them as a trusted brand. And, um, and uh, but, but it's not only the sales and marketing aspects that I've seen uh, cybersecurity being used for for increased revenue, actually, there's been a quite a bit in uh, recruitment uh, mm -hmm. since we all know there is a huge skills gap in cybersecurity. And we've seen also that a lot of uh, roles, other roles like in IT, in development, DevOps, they're also looking for environments where they can upskill their current, <laughs> uh, you know, technical uh, <clears throat> portfolio and uh, and skills uh, with security. So moving into DevSecOps, from IT sysadmin to security engineer, from a software developer to application security professional, right? And uh, if you offer an environment where security is the primary, you know, topic is uh, something that the C level and everybody else is highly communicating inside, you, you, you would expect that this would be a great environment to flourish your cybersecurity skills. De definitely. And it's basically a holistic approach if you incorporate security into every step of your company. <clears throat> and from the defensive side, if we go one step back to the actual architecture, so how you're going to set up your security, your policies, procedures, everything, like your infrastructure, uh, I think that the most important thing nowadays is to use the, the zero trust. So mm -hmm. basically Absolutely. that means that you shouldn't have anything that's not really necessary and you shouldn't trust anyone and you should keep only those things that are really needed. Right. Well, it's uh, not a very social <laughs> way of uh, implementing security, but not trusting by default when it comes to systems, computers, accounts, um, proved to be so far uh, the the most modern best way to to protect the environment with zero trust. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, so and, and in terms of this cultural thing and uh, you know uh, educating employees uh, and just moving the entire company into more security aware um, cultural environment, uh, we've still seen that the same attack, vectors are being used, you know, to try to penetrate the company. We're still seeing that still phishing is the top way to, to try to get into the systems. 
We've seen that, you know, ransomware is the payload that is being mostly administered um, through phishing and other, um, well, social engineering, let's call it in general, but phishing dominantly used as uh, the tool. Uh, why do you think that is? Definitely. Uh, well, it's because the, most of the companies are actually lacking good cybersecurity awareness training. So nowadays, almost 100% of companies do have a training, but it's a track box based training. So basically you have a website, you look a video that lasts for 10 to 30 minutes, then you have... Oh, that's too long. I've seen <laughs> them two to five minutes, I think. <laughs> yeah, that can even be the case. But the point is that after looking at one video and answering to 10 questions, you do not have actually a culture. And okay, maybe you will pass some audits, maybe you will get some security certifications, but that doesn't change the fact that you're still vulnerable to, yeah. to those attacks. And it's pretty easy to also serve a payload called ransomware through a phishing attack. And uh, attackers are targeting your company with also with internal information. So basically you have a lot of information on LinkedIn, Instagram, and basically have a, every social network that helps the external attacker understand the insides of your company. With that information, it's pretty easy to conclude that tomorrow, for example, you're expecting a meeting link through Zoom, Teams mm -hmm. or Google Meet. And if you send that and it redirects to hacker search page, it's really easy to serve a payload through the browser or enable some installation of a malware and malicious files. Yeah, so so basically the the assumption that majority of the companies still don't do security well, they don't train their employees well, they don't have a security culture present, is why phishing is still number one way to successfully <laughs> hack yeah, the company. Definitely. Right? Uh, but why ransomware? Well, I mean, we we have seen ransomware present what ten years now, like actively. <laughs> yeah. There has been some articles uh, mentioning uh, ransomware, first ransomware being. Uh, developed quite a bit yeah. uh, before that, but the modern ransomware, I think in the past 10 years have, have been already uh, successfully present. And why do you think we are still unsuccessful to to, to fight ransomware? Even after they fail <laughs> yeah. the, the, the phishing <laughs> test, there should be mechanisms there to, to yeah. prevent ransomware from spreading on its own. That's a very good question. I think the main reason is because of the attacker a malicious hacker, black hat, so-called, uh, he has like hundreds of entry points. So he just needs to find one entry point and you as a company or service provider, you have defend and all of those endpoints. So it's very hard to cover all of those, even from the start. So you need at least one or two years to establish a good security culture and good security awareness. That's, that's true. I've felt on my own skin, <laughs> sometimes how challenging I'm it can sure. be. Um, yeah, that's uh, uh, that, that's that's absolutely true. But I think the the social uh, engineering aspect just is, is fascinating to me. That you know the the same the same methodology of you know scamming, fooling someone through SMS, through mm. phone calls, through email, social media, even on LinkedIn, Facebook, and all of those, you still get quite a bit of these and they still, still uh, hit the targets uh, successfully is, uh, it, I don't know, it's just fascinating. And I think we still have quite a bit of time uh, to, to go uh, an effort to put in to actually fight this. Um, yeah, that's because, I mean, people are the most vulnerable point of every every company. And yeah, yeah, they, they do the call technology it. improves, but the same people are using that technology and yeah, if they are not trained well, it's basically, it doesn't matter if you have like a security operations center or like blue team, a defensive team of security guys, if somebody is just going to download something or use their own device at work and at home, for example, watch Netflix and open like some really important company data, such as NDAs and yeah. financial data. Yeah, it is. It, <clears throat> it really, it really boils down. This is why I, I, I keep, you know, fixed with this topic is just uh, that uh, I, I believe the root cause is just that keeping up with the current educational method of security awareness is, is, is failing, is constantly failing. And some companies are doing it right, but only some. And even for how long, 
you know, that's the question, but majority of the companies and the government and we keep forgetting citizens at home are not doing it at all. <laughs> yeah. uh, I strongly believe that cybersecurity, at least in the basic awareness form, should be part of regular education in schools. What do you think about that? Uh, definitely. I was just about to say that. So we should always go one step back and start from the beginning. So everybody, like even your children, <laughs> nowadays your daughter is using their mobile phone and I'm sure she will be <laughs> secure. But That's impossible <laughs> to, to protect yeah. her from that. <laughs> I'm trying to delay as much as possible, but no, it's, uh, I think I'm losing the battle already. <laughs> yeah, but it's, at least you're trying and you know what you're, what you're doing for, for sure. And yeah, basically we, we should teach also children and also like from the starting point in primary schools where you get your first computer, you should be aware that anything can happen on the internet. Anything that you can possibly imagine internet. is also possible. Yeah, internet is a dangerous... It's a fun and dangerous place at the same time. <laughs> everything good and everything bad pretty much lives on the internet. And I agree that as even primary school, I think is is not early at all. It's actually like even before that, when they start, you know, using the devices, some guidance needs to be provided. There are parental controls now in the in the apps, like YouTube Kids, is I think one of the more successful ones that I don't think parents are actually <laughs> using. Uh, they should, yeah. if, if you don't know about that one, definitely use it uh, um, and just filter, you know, the uh, what the kids can watch for their appropriate age and um, that the entire internet should not be accessible yeah. by, by, by children. It's definitely. even some adults, <laughs> I would argue, but <laughs> that, that's, a, that's another topic. That's uh, uh, definitely the educational aspect needs to be uh, heavily improved. And uh, and the, to build a community around, yeah. you know, bringing this into schools. Yeah, and how could we do that? So I guess we should start talking more to governments. So that's basically the gap we should bridge between the government part and our private industry. I fully agree, um, and I think this would also contribute to bridging the skills gap in cybersecurity later, as uh, if young individuals are already feeling comfortable with cyber in general from you know young age not just consuming media but actually knowing about protective controls and things like that they are more likely to go down the path of cybersecurity professionals which now we are missing millions <laughs> i think only the the east reported like 1.5 million of cybersecurity vacancies mm -hmm. that they have alone and this is insane number <laughs> so um I recommend everybody to join Cybersecurity Academy is around, around you or talk to us, right? We, I think we can teach you a thing or two. <laughs> yeah, Definitely. We have a fair share of, of experience protecting things that matter. And uh, could you say that if we start doing that today or tomorrow, can we expect in 10 to 15 years that everybody will be at least a bit security aware, which That's... will have a great impact on everyone? Well, that's the future I would like to live in for sure. So, uh, yeah, let's definitely see how, how that will go. Um, yeah, maybe to, to wrap up here, um, I think, we, so we started from the offensive security side of things. We've discussed about, you know, the motivations between, uh, behind the attacks, uh, and, the the most valuable targets, uh, like governments and, um, you know, the political, the financial, the reputational motivations behind. Uh, the attacks and that everybody can be a target. Um, and uh, yeah, then we moved into this uh, defensive uh, security and how building a strong security culture is actually the paramount of, you know, going any deeper into highly technical security defensive mechanisms and, uh, and how cybersecurity is not a cost center, <laughs> but actually a very profitable uh, revenue generator, very, very potent revenue generator. And, and that's phishing and ransomware and all the mostly used, um, you know, attack vectors and payloads, uh, can all be discarded, you know, and defended against by a uh, strong security culture, that's educated true. employees. And that actually in the end, the education should leave the private sector and actually be introduced into into schools into very early 
early stage of uh, of all children to learn about cyber literacy and the uh, dangers on the internet. Definitely. We, I mean, with that approach, it would be also not so hard to protect every company and every individual. Yeah, it's it's pretty easy to <laughs> for the hackers to get into your company, but it's also not so hard to protect if you pay attention from the start. If you have like uh, zero trust principles, if you have only the things that you really need to have and if you see security as a necessary thing, but also as a profit generator rather than a cost center. I fully agree. Um, yeah, I think we managed to to cover most important topics. Um, and that's a wrap. Thanks everybody for watching. Uh, very candid conversation between two cybersecurity professionals on the latest cybersecurity topics. I hope you learned something new, uh, like how to defend your company, how to teach your employees and everybody at home on uh, best cybersecurity practices. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at any time.